A lot of series I read, like Black Clover and Jujutsu Kaisen, receive Naruto comparisons, especially Black Clover. This has always been a series that I've been told is a copy of Naruto, so I decided to start reading the series since it's one of the most beloved manga of all time. And now that I've read the first two arcs of this series, I'm very confused on why these statements exist, like people actually die in Naruto. I was extremely surprised with how dark this series is. Honestly, I would say Naruto is darker than Jujutsu Kaisen as well, I'll get into this later, but dark aspects of Naruto feel way too real, like I'm under the impression that Kishimoto really enjoyed history classes. But again, I found it really funny to finally read this series and realize that it is completely different from how the anime community portrays it. I really shouldn't be surprised though, a lot of the time when shonen fandoms talk about something there's a good chance that there's some exaggeration at play, like how are Yuno and Megumi Sasuke clones? People just say anything nowadays. Let me get back on track though, that's not what this video is for. So with that out of the way, it's time to talk about my thoughts on the first arc, Land of the Waves. This arc is definitely one of my favorite introduction arcs to a series. It reminds me a lot of Kagurabachi's first arc to where it has the perfect antagonist to set the tone of the story. The first chapter is really solid, introduces us to Naruto, his reasoning for wanting to become the Hokage, while giving the reader some lore to explain why this goal will be a challenge for our hero. This chapter is also the introduction to Naruto's favorite move, the doppelganger jutsu. Like Naruto spams this move, and honestly I don't blame him because jumping your enemy with multiple versions of yourself is cool as hell. Afterwards, the next couple of chapters consist of the first encounters with Sasuke, Sakura, and Kakashi. Sasuke being the cool-headed person who's the rival character, Sakura the girl Naruto is madly in love with while also being the comic relief character, and Kakashi being the mentor who trolls you and then gaslights you into believing that this is a teaching moment. Looking back, it's pretty hilarious how goofy chapter 3 is in comparison to the rest of the series. Like there's Naruto and Sasuke kissing and Naruto taking on the floor of Sasuke. Now, if I had to rank them, I'd say I enjoy Naruto the most, Sakura second, and Sasuke in third place. I know there are probably people ready to smash the dislike button, tell me that I'm an idiot in the comments, and click off the video. But those are my feelings. I could easily appeal to the masses and say I like Sasuke the most and hate Sakura because I don't live under a rock. I know Sakura is one of the most slandered anime characters of all time. But again, I pride myself in being honest with y'all, and so far, I don't really have any major issues with Sakura. I will say though, before I get back into talking talking about the rest of the arc, Sakura being in love with Sasuke is kind of hilarious because she has way better chemistry with Naruto, like they even talk the same. Although Sasuke has the edgy cool boy tax and he represents the strength that she wants to achieve so I'll kind of let it slide. But after all the goofy beginning chapters, the story transitions to Kakashi's test which gives some much needed team building moments for team 7, like Sasuke and Sakura sharing their lunch with Naruto even at the risk of failing the test, showcasing the qualities of a true shinobi. It's all pretty solid character work to get the reader adjusted to the world, but where the meat and potatoes of this arc lie are when Zabuza is introduced. Everything that transpires after Zabuza appears is great, from good fight choreography and interesting abilities to great character defining moments for the big players of this arc. There's some really great moments between Naruto and Sasuke, basically everything in chapter 27 resembling Zabuza and Haku's relationship without the toxic nature behind it. Anytime I hear about this series, there's always some notion that Naruto and Sasuke's rivalry is toxic. So far, I'm not seeing it yet. The two act like long lost brothers who just like to banter with each other. It's basically the tsundere trope with these two. As much as either of them try to deny it, they deeply care about each other. But this arc really drives home the dark reality of this world, having Haku devoid of most of their humanity with their only life purpose being Zabuza's tool. It really does seem like Zabuza is complete trash until his moment of vulnerability before his death, which added the whole other layer to his character, with Haku and Zabuza having tragic deaths as a a result of being tools in a much larger scheme. Like it's a pretty depressing first arc that at first gives off the impression that being a shinobi will only lead to suffering, which gives birth to Naruto's ideals to reject being a cog, embracing individuality, and creating his own destiny, contradictory to the ideology of a shinobi. Yuji, take notes. Thus, I am excited to see how Naruto challenges a world that is suffocating in darkness. Again, this arc does a really good job in setting a foundation for the story, so the Land of the Waves arc is a banger start for the series. Now, next is the arc I think people are most excited to hear my thoughts on the tuning exams, essentially the series hunter exam. And this arc is where a lot of important characters are introduced. Well, I say important now, but who knows? 600 chapters later, half of these people introduced in this arc might not even be relevant, time will tell. Anyways, the next couple of chapters set up dynamics between characters like Rock Lee immediately wanting to throw hands with Sasuke. At this point in the story, Rock Lee was annoying me like crazy. I was constantly thinking, get this bum off my screen, he has no aura. When Naruto sims for Sakura, it doesn't bother me. When Rock Lee does it, I cringe. You might say, well local, you have to at least respect him for bodying Sasuke.
Sasuke at their first encounter, and I would respond back to you telling you that I don't care. Dudes cringe. That shit is fucking trash, dog. Get the fuck off the airway. But after Rock Lee's Requiem of Cringe, the exam finally starts with a paper test. I really like the first phase of this exam. A test of one's ability to gain information where you can only answer the questions by cheating while trying not to get caught at the same time. There's some sick showcases of abilities throughout this section, so it's fun to watch how characters are going to cheat. The test also showcases the mind games that will occur on this job, all concluding with Naruto passing the test through sheer willpower. That's just what happens when you are the best character in the series. Also, this exam sets up a major running theme in Naruto that in order to succeed, you need to be a rat. As someone who reads Jujutsu Kaisen, it's nice to see that I'll be getting fights where characters use underhanded tactics and jump each other again. Game is game in this universe. Now, the second phase of the Chunin exams is easily my least favorite section of this arc. There are just a lot of chapters that felt like a slog to read. The Orochimaru and Sasuke plotline intrigued me the most. I really like Orochimaru as an antagonist. He has a good presence regardless of whether he is or isn't on the panel. This is a result of the fact that while the dude is insanely strong, he also has all these subordinates running around at all times. Like it feels impossible to take him down. Plus, with Sasuke having the cursed seal placed on him, it seems like Orochimaru is grooming another powerful puppet like Kabuto, which by the way, screw this guy. I hate Kabuto. I hope Kishimoto kills him off soon. Anyways, after the mid that was the second phase, the preliminary start, and it's only good from this point onwards. Before the big fights of the preliminaries, there's some appetizers like Sasuke versus Yaori, Zaku versus Shino, and Misumi versus Konkuro. Old matches is just further drive home just how brutal this series is. Like Shino literally has a whole bunch of bugs that orbit inside his body, using them to plug the exit holes in Zaku's hands so that Chakra would build up in his arms, causing them to explode. Then there's Konkuro almost getting his neck snapped, which leads into Misumi getting all of his bones crushed by Konkuro's puppet. Really cool fights to expand the power system, but damn, these kids do not be playing in this series. Sakura versus Ino was a solid fight. I like that while Sakura is definitely the weakest out of the trio, through her insane chakra manipulation, she can still hold her own. Ending in a tie with Ino, I kind of wish Kishimoto just gave Sakura the win here because she's better than Ino. Ino is just the worst Sakura to me. Get her out of here. Moving on though, there is Hinata versus Neji, which is primarily set up for Neji's later fight while giving some character development for Hinata. It's cool to see how Naruto is inspiring others throughout the story and Hinata locked in. She obviously wasn't going to win the fight, but she won the war. She didn't prove Neji right, so props to her. Now, Rock Lee versus Gara is the most hyped up fight in this arc, and I don't really understand why. But before you pause the video and start rage commenting about how I'm illiterate, maybe watch the entire video before losing your mind. Just a thought. I think the fight is solid. There's a lot of character work for Rock Lee. He has a backstory that makes you want to root for him, which was needed because I hated Rock Lee before this fight. But it's really Rock Lee that does all the carrying during this section. There's nothing from Gara in this fight that had me losing my mind or igniting some hype emotions for me. Again, I'm not saying that this fight is bad because the internet has conditioned people to think that if you aren't calling something peak fiction or the greatest of all time, it must be ass. I simply just think that this fight was solid. There are simply some fights that happen later on in this arc that I enjoyed more. I think it's also a combination of constantly being told how great this fight is. So when finishing it, it my immediate reaction was, yeah, this was a bit overhyped. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! I'm only reading the manga right now for this journey, so maybe the anime's version of this fight is better than the manga, but I doubt that cool animation is going to drastically change my mind on this fight because, again, I enjoy the content of other fights in this arc much more. So after Rock Lee gets packed up, the tuning exams momentarily stops for a one-month time skip to occur, allowing for characters to get a much-needed buff, which leads into the introduction of Naruto's new mentor, Jiraiya. Now, this guy's pretty cringe so far. Personally, the Drake tends tendencies are not really my thing, but Jiraiya plays off Naruto pretty well, so I'll let it cook. But basically right now, Jiraiya is pretty ass to me. That's the most blunt I can say it. So after Naruto's training with Jiraiya is concluded, the arc heads into what is easily my favorite fight in this arc. Naruto versus Neji is undoubtedly the peak of this series so far. I was blown away at just how good this fight was. Rock Lee versus Gaurat? No, this is the fight people should have been hyping up when I heard about the tuning exams. This fight is where I believe the main message of Naruto starts to show itself, which I will get more into later on in this video. The fight consists of Naruto and Neji being two individuals cursed by their birth, especially Neji with his tragic backstory about the Yuga clan. This series already has a dark tone to it, but even still, I was shocked with his backstory. Like the Yuga clan is horrible. A cursed mark jutsu where the main branch can kill members of the cadet branch at the snap of their fingers is terrifying, especially with the added knowledge that Neji had this mark branded on his forehead at the age of four. It really puts into question if it is possible to overwrite the fate assigned to you. And with our knowledge of Naruto's origins in chapter 1, the dynamic 
between these two cooks up the best meal this series has to offer. The page turned to the final spread of chapter 103 activated the dopamine rush, the fever you could say. This is probably the best time for me to mention this, but the art in Naruto is really damn good. So when you add all these elements together, this series finally achieves a fight to where I am now completely on board with this manga. Naruto is 700 chapters long, so if this manga can produce multiple fights on this level, I will have some aggressive agendas to push. Kishimoto, I'm putting my stocks into you, please do not let me down. But the high quality fights don't stop there, because after Naruto vs Neji is Shikimaru vs Tamari. Earlier, I said that there were some fights that occurred later on in this arc that I liked more than Rock Lee vs Gara, and this is one of them. Shikimaru's misogyny aside, which I hope he gets educated on, this fight is great. The contradiction of Shikimaru being lazy, but also at the same time a genius is a treat to witness. This fight also highlights why so far I am absolutely loving the power system. The way Shikimaru's shadow possession technique is utilized in this fight reminds me of stand battles in JoJo's. A game of chess where both parties are trying to achieve their win condition as quickly as possible, slowly revealing more information to each other in hopes of tricking their opponent. As someone who loves card games, the series that can replicate that atmosphere of constant mind games bring me a different type of joy. So when it's revealed that Shikimaru used the parachute as bait and his actual strategy was to use the tunnels formed from the previous match to achieve his win condition, that was a cathartic moment for me as the reader. It was also interesting to see that he ended up quitting even though his victory was confirmed. Also, with the statements that Shikimaru has the qualities to be a natural leader, I am excited to see where his character goes. Maybe through becoming a platoon leader, Shikimaru will gain some purpose in his life and that's what his character arc is going to be. He's an interesting character that I don't think I figured out yet, so I'm hoping that he gets more major focus in later arcs. Now after Shikimaru's fight is the climax of this arc, Sasuke vs Gara, and I can't lie that entrance from Sasuke was pretty raw. This fight is pretty much just used to showcase Sasuke's new ability, Chidori, which at this point I would say is Sasuke's coolest technique so far. At the same time, Gara is continuing to lose his mind, embracing darkness so that he can feel human. A lot of the content with Gara in this fight seems to be set up for later, so there isn't really much for me to speak on in regards to his character during this fight, although I can theorize where his character is headed. Sasuke vs Gara was always a matchup I found to be weird for multiple reasons. I knew that this arc ended at chapter 115 and with the betrayal of the Sand Village looming in the background, Sasuke and Gara's fight being interrupted was inevitable. Plus, with the previous moments in chapter 97, I feel that the only way for Gara to be saved is to fight Naruto. Gara believes that killing is the only way to validate his existence as the curse placed on Gara gave him no other reason for living. Paralleling Naruto's situation with the Nine Tails, so just like the Neji fight, I believe Naruto will be the one to open Gara's mind to understand that there is more to life than hatred, which again seems to be the main message of Naruto so far to overcome one's fate and surpass hatred. Now the last thing I'll be talking about in this video is of course that final chapter. The ending of this arc is insane, with Orochimaru launching an attack on Konoha Village, being the one that has been orchestrating everything in the background. Orochimaru's presence in this story so far has been nothing short of amazing. The fact that he can hide his true identity behind other characters keeps you in a state of tension during every scene because you never know when he is going to appear. I also love the line about how treaties are essentially a smokescreen to trick the other party into relaxing and lowering their guard, which ties into one of my favorite aspects about this series, the world building in Naruto is great. A lot of shonen series cover similar topics in Naruto and I always found myself annoyed when this series never focused on the political aspects of their story. The execution of the politics in Naruto have been great so far with a lot of panels pertaining to these plot lines sprinkled into chapters to build up to these climactic moments. All of this just allows for the world of Naruto to feel real. Naruto is an extremely dark series. The world is in a constant state of war where things like child soldiers, clan slaves, terrorism, and literal grooming of children are all present. It's a world that feels grim and hopeless, which is why the protagonist being the source of light that rejects his cruel fate of this world is so inspiring. As a result, I'm fully locked in with this series, Naruto Uzumaki, show me who you are, the man who will become Hokage. If you stuck around till the end of the video, I just want you to know that I appreciate you. And if you want to talk to me about anime related topics, join my Discord server, Also consider becoming a channel member, another way to support me and I support you back with shoutouts at the end of the video, early access to new videos, custom emotes, and members only videos depending on which level of membership you decide to choose. And if you're someone that enjoys anime content that keeps it real, consider subscribing so when I hit 10k, you can brag about being a day one. I gotta get back in the kitchen to cook. Peace.